Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Today we're diving back into Casual Lectures, which is a fairly new channel that has grown a ton. They're about to hit 100,000 subscribers and they've only done like 30 videos so far in a real short time. Kind of a, I would say, a mo they've modeled themselves after Sam Onella. Very similar style in terms of their thumbnails and their animation style and even their presentation. And as I say all the time, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So obviously that is a, a nod to the success and the entertainment value of Sam Onella. So I want to give a, a big shout out and thank you to Trayson in Sutton, Nebraska and Zach. Zach's always here on the channel uh, from Lake Jackson, Texas. Thank you so much for your support as executive producer level patrons. Really appreciate it. As always, the links in the description below if you want to see the original uh, work without my commentary or check out any of their other videos. Let's check out the wild world of Roman jobs. Ancient Rome was a multi-ethnic society with a large population that required a broad spectrum of jobs to sustain its economy. However, choosing their career was not always an option for the general people. This was only possible for people with higher status or inherited roles. Prestigious professions, military leadership and political administration were reserved for the Roman upper class, whereas ordinary people were involved in various jobs. Moreover, the Roman Empire depended on slaves and any wealthy person could keep as many as 500 slaves. The so he makes a couple of great points right off the bat, and this is something we have to understand not only about the Roman Empire, but history in general, is that for most of human history, the idea that we take for granted here in the United States and in many other countries around the world that you can aspire to be anything that, you know, a, a kid growing up like my son right now, 11 years old, is really into like astrophysics and the idea that he could decide as the son of a school counselor and a guy who does YouTube for a living that he could be an astrophysicist for most of human history, that wouldn't have been possible. Uh, you were largely confined to your class, or at the very least, you were very likely to end up doing the same job your father did. Uh, you would be apprenticed out, or you would learn from him, and that was just kind of where you were, and you were pretty much stuck there with a little bit of wiggle room, and, and depending on your nationality and your citizenship and all these sorts of things, you had a little bit of movement, but you couldn't really just be anything. The slaves were controlled such that they had to partake in challenging, unpleasant works of low esteem. The typical jobs were farming, construction and domestic services, and educated slaves could work in medicine, teaching, accounting and artists. And that's another great point about the Roman Empire is that we do a disservice to history when we think of the idea of slavery in the Roman Empire as the same as the chattel slavery of the United States up till the 1860s. Not at all the same thing. Slavery takes many shapes and forms, and slaves in the Roman Empire had a lot higher standard of living and, and enjoyed a lot more freedom than a slave out having to pick cotton in 1855 in the United States. Some jobs, however, like the orgy planner or urine collector, were bizarre even to the slaves. So today that we take quickly. a look at the weird Roman job. The weirder a job is, the higher it is ranked on the list, while more normal jobs are ranked lower. Let's By the way, while I'm thinking about it, and I will put a link down in the description for this, we currently have six spots open for the tour we're doing to Italy together, Rome and Florence, and then we're gonna stay an extra day or two and go down to Anzio, and I'll be posting more details about that soon. But you can book yourself on the trip, and I'm in the process of looking at what other trips we're gonna do for next year, and hopefully announcing some of those soon. Start off the F tier with a job that actually still exists today, even though it may have changed slightly. Just like our astrologists who try to predict your future by your zodiac sign or tarot cards, the ancient Romans had their own version of that profession. You're a Gemini, you probably experienced deja vu, the feeling that this moment has happened before. I definitely was not expecting us to go down the road of SpongeBob. And you also experienced deja vu, the feeling that this moment has happened before. The Polarius were chicken interpreters who told the fortune of military campaigns based on how chickens ate. Instead of being tasked with taking care of more regal birds like eagles or owls, the Polarius had to take care of sacred military chickens. Sacred military 
chickens. Now, it is easy for us to judge this, but I'll tell you what, when I was a 12 year old, I would go outside into my driveway where we had a basketball hoop. And I would sometimes make decisions, like important life decisions on whether or not I made a free throw. Okay, I'm going to ask this girl if she likes me if I make this free throw. Oh, I missed. Okay, best two out of three. Stupid stuff like that, right? So uh, at the time, this probably made sense to a lot of people. One of the strongest empires in history literally had chickens that were relied on to tell whether a battle would go well or not for the Roman army. Before a battle, a Polarius would release the chickens and throw corn on the ground. If the chickens ate, all was well. If they ate so messily they dropped kernels, even better. If they didn't eat, oh no. If they refused to come out of their cages, you may as well send everyone home. There even is a story about one Roman fleet commander who was so impatient with the poor birds, who were understandably dizzy from sailing, not wanting to come out of their cage that he threw them overboard. He lost the battle and was scolded for drowning his fleet's sacred war chickens. I he literally confirmed the prophecy, didn't he? I think this profession perfectly defines the F tier. It is somewhat strange, but considering that we still do the same thing today, it's kind of normal at least for this list. We all know it and we all hate it. You are at a party and someone approaches you but damn you forgot their name, which could result in embarrassment. Sucks for you, but the Romans were perfectly prepared for such a situation. The Roman profession of name caller or nomenclator had one simple task, to remember everyone's name at a party or other event. As efficient as the Romans were- That actually makes a whole lot of sense and we have that today, right? Like, you're King Charles uh, in the UK and you go to some party or you have some event, there's no way you know all those people. So you probably got somebody standing next to you saying, your majesty, this is so-and-so, uh, and, and kind of introducing them as they come through. And the president probably has similar things. Uh, cool. Were, they had a backup for not remembering people's names at gatherings and parties, saving themselves from embarrassment. When people would approach their masters, the nomenclator would loudly announce the name of whoever would come, saving a deadly social embarrassment. What sounds like a Makes funny a party sense. gimmick at first was actually also a crucial political instrument. Political candidates would be accompanied by their respective nomenclators, who prevented any embarrassment for the candidate. Whenever someone would approach- So you would travel with somebody who would introduce you. That's actually- See, that actually makes a whole lot of sense to me. The candidates in a friendly or personal manner, they would ensure the candidate by calling out the approaching person's name out loud. That's why this job is in F tier, since it isn't really weird, but rather unique. Ah, oh, the Vestal Virgins. The last candidate for the F tier is the position of Vestal Virgins. In ancient Rome, the Vestals were known to be the priestesses of the Roman goddess Vesta, the goddess of the hearth, and were considered vital to the security of Rome. The duty of the Vestals was to keep the fire in the temple of Vesta burning. They believed that the failure to do so would lead to chaos in the empire. It was essential for the Romans that the Vestals were virgins. You might touch the finish line, but you've never touched a woman. You're right. I haven't lost my virginity. This was obviously a Please tell me that's not actually something that's in Sonic. <laughs> and that they just did a voiceover. A drawback and a risk at the same time. If they were to lose their virginity, they were usually walled alive and then left to dehydrate, a truly brutal punishment. Other Vestals who broke any other vow, such as letting the temple fire go out, were beaten behind a curtain in the dark. However, the good in all this was that they were treated fairly well and given special game seats. So all in all, I would consider this job to be quite normal, especially considering that even modern monks and nuns still vow to abstain from any sexual activity. Although luckily, the punishments today aren't nearly as harsh. And you know, there's all throughout religious life there, not just when it comes to abstaining from sex, but there are... Uh, aspects of various religious orders and things like that that have to do with what you're willing to sacrifice. And, and even today, I mean, Christians, Muslims, others have times where they fast, right? Muslims have Ramadan where they fast during daylight hours. And, and this is all about sacrificing something as a way of drawing closer to God, as a way of acknowledging him, things like that. Now we enter the E tier with a rather interesting but kind of controversial job. 
In the ancient world, a funeral clown was common enough to leave behind records of clowns making fun of the dead at their own funerals. That's actually really kind of awesome. <laughs> and now I think I might want one. These funeral clowns would mimic the behavior of the deceased. It wasn't just any behavior either. They specifically picked ones that made the deceased look bad. Oh. Of course, this was done in a funny way that wouldn't offend the audience, which was likely made up of friends and family. So it was like a roast. You had a clown who roasted you at your funeral. That's really pretty cool. Wouldn't tolerate actual slander. One amusing account from Suetonius, a Roman historian, tells of a funeral clown mocking Vespasian, the emperor famous for his role in building the Colosseum, for his stinginess. The funeral clown was said to have asked the crowd, while still pretending to be Vespasian, how much the funeral would cost him. Considering that most of our modern death rituals are connected with immense grief, this might seem weird to many of you. However, I think the concept that a dead person gives his friends and relatives one last laugh through one of these clowns doesn't sound too bad. That's really pretty awesome. My father-in-law, who passed away six years ago, uh, a few years before he died, he he was really into hunting. He was a big hunter and fisher and had a huge gun collection. And um, He jokingly told us that when he died, he wanted to be stuffed and mounted with a gun in his hand at the funeral. So when people walked in, that was the first thing they saw. And I actually, I did his funeral. I officiated his funeral. And uh, we had a good laugh when I, I mentioned that at the funeral. And so, you know, there's absolutely a time and place to laugh in a funeral. Um, especially, you know, losing the parents who raised me in the last year. They were both in their 80s. They had a good long life. Uh, and while we were very sad and we missed them dearly, it's not as hard in that case as it was like, say, when I lost my brother a few years ago at 50 from COVID. Uh, that There was a lot more grief and, and a lot more pain in that one because it was too soon and he had a young family and things like that. Um, so it all really kind of depends. But there's a place for laughter, laughter in, in a funeral for sure. In ancient Rome, asking the gods for help was common if one could not personally take revenge. A curse against their enemies was ordered by the hateful and the superstitious. The middlemen between the gods and the hateful person were called cursed tablet scribes. The entire day they would hear people's complaints of hate for others and the wrongdoings they had endured. They would take people's requests for revenge and etch a curse onto a soft lead plate. Those cursed tablets were believed to have influential power against the gods and they I absolutely believe that to be true, too. I, I, And this is maybe something I'll cover on VTH Extra at some point, and this comes from my, my Christian faith. I absolutely do believe there is a spiritual component to issuing curses, uttering curses against people. I don't think it's completely harmless. I really don't. Uh, so this is actually really fascinating to me. It would either be nailed to the wall of temples or rolled up, placed underground in graves or thrown into wells or lakes. Wow. All manners of cruel punishments consisting of blindness, madness, and hopes of the enemy's Dang. intestines being eaten away would be wished for in those curses. The treatment done to the material was compared to what should be done to the target of the spell. The curses would be written backward if needed to be extra effective. That's definitely a weird custom, but considering nowadays people use fake Twitter accounts to insult other people. Is that he actually it makes a really good point there that is really kind of the 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 ancient version of exactly that this concept doesn't seem too far-fetched now we are coming into the d tier featuring the fuller fulling is the process of cleaning clothes especially wool to remove oils dirt and other impurities and make them thicker Ancient Use urine. Roman times were popular for fulling by making the slaves stand ankle deep in the urine. As filthy as it sounds, the urine sounds gross, but they not only used it to clean their clothes, they used it to brush their teeth too. Practicality of the concept lies in the fact that urine was a source of ammonium salts. It was known as the wash that assisted in cleansing and whitening clothes. The use of urine faded when more sophisticated concepts of water mills came into place. The job itself was basically a very early form of someone doing laundry, which isn't weird at all. However, the part where you have to stand in ankle deep urine makes this whole thing relatively unpleasant, I would imagine. However, urine was actually so important in ancient Rome that they even had official urine tax collectors who, spoiler, will be featured later on this list. 
Like Another waxing, candidate waxing? for this tier is the position of armpit hair plucker. Armpit hair pluckers filled bathhouses with the screams of their clients. Roman baths were hubs of public life and of public image. One of the many services offered at the baths was armpit plucking employed by bathhouse guilds to manually pluck the armpit hairs of patrons with tweezers. The philosopher Seneca- All I can think of is that Steve Carell scene in 40 year old virgin, which was real. They really were waxing his hairy chest. Ouch. Notes that the armpit pluckers would shout in the bathhouses to get people to get their pits plucked. And when the pit plucker wasn't shouting, he was forcing his customer to shriek instead of him. Honestly, this job was pretty normal considering that armpit waxing isn't out of the ordinary even today. However, I think that turning this waxing process into a public event at the bathhouse makes it a little weirder than it needed to be. Listen, our concepts of what is normal and what is weird are very different than they used to be in the past. I mean, look at the, the way that they had their their bathrooms, right? Bunch of guys sitting around a room all pooping together, right? Can't even imagine that now. People in Europe sometimes think it's weird that in the United States, our stalls and our public bathrooms don't go all the way down to the floor and you can see people's feet underneath. To us, that's normal. To other people, that's weird. Uh, there's stuff that we do today that seems very normal that to future generations. People are going to say, really? You did that? Now we enter the C tier, the perfect middle ground between somewhat normal jobs that are also pretty weird. Vicarious were the middle managers between their masters and their fellow slaves. And yeah, we're literally talking about real middle manager slaves who managed other slaves. That just sounds like slavery with extra steps. Ooh la la. Living vicariously through someone else. Oh, someone's gonna get laid in college. According to Vicky Leon, author of Working 9th to V, slave owners would buy slaves to serve as their body doubles at work and do their work for them. These vicarious would then be lived vicariously by their owners, who would send them to do office there work. There you go. It wasn't so bad of a gig either, since it turns out that some vicars would be given access to part or all of their master's assets. Some of them would be paid a portion of the profits made, allowing them to eventually buy their freedoms. Ironically, more enterprising slaves, however, would opt to buy their own vicarious and continue growing their master's wealth so they could continue taking a cut. So while this management position isn't far off from modern businesses, the ancient slaves aspect makes that job very questionable. We finally enter the B tier with the job everyone has been looking forward to, the Roman orgy planner. I mean, is this like a wedding planner, but for orgies? The planners were responsible for planning the perfect orgies and sex parties where guests freely partake in open and unrestrained sexual activities, including group sex. They had the authority to select the food, drinks and music, as well as women. Those women could attend the orgy who were capable of making the event of utmost entertainment for the guests. The Greco-Roman world shared the party god Bacchus, lord of wine and ritual madness, and celebrated him with the Bacchan- I need to know what ritual madness is. You can't just gloss over a statement like that. We need to look into this one a little more. The raving ones of ancient Greek civilization. So this actually goes back to the Greeks and not just the Romans, which the Romans borrowed a lot of things from the Greeks. Cultist rites associated with worship of the Greek god of wine, Dionysus, or Bacchus in Roman mythology, were allegedly characterized by maniacal dancing to the sound of loud music and crashing cymbals, in which the revelers, called Bacchantes, world screamed, became drunk, and incited one another to greater and greater ecstasy. So it's like a rave, right? I guess. The goal is to achieve a state of enthusiasm in which the celebrants' souls were temporarily freed from their earthly bodies and were able to commune with Bacchus Dionysus and gain a glimpse of and a preparation for what would someday experience in eternity. Frenzied feats of strength and madness, such as uprooting trees, tearing a bull apart with their bare hands, and eating its flesh raw. This latter rite was a sacrament akin to communion in which the participants assumed the strength and character of the god by symbolically eating the raw flesh and drinking the blood of his symbolic incarnation. Having symbolically eaten his body and drunk his blood, yeah, it's like communion, the celebrants became possessed by Dionysus. Wow. You learn something new every day. Fascinating. Nalia. 
Attendance of these parties had a tendency to really tap into that divine crazy party energy and go around on a debauched, often violent sex spree. At one orgy, legendary bisexual Alcibiades, an Athenian statesman and his homies, stole the dicks of hundreds of statues throughout Athens. However, the planners were despised, especially by the lower class, as they thought the entire event to be unnecessarily luxurious and expensive, or simply because they didn't get an invite themselves. All in all, the job must have been really funny, but I think I don't even have to explain why this job description might seem weird to some people. I mean, somebody had to do it. We start off the A tier with the position of Stercorarius, or to say it more bluntly, the shit collector. That is one big pile of shit. Ancient Rome was famous for its aqueducts and toilets, innovations that were so advanced it would yeah. take centuries to see them return after the... That's one of the things I often wonder about. Had the Roman Empire cont continued to stay as strong as it was, how more quickly might civilization have advanced? Because look at some of the stuff that they had that, like you said, yeah, it took a long time before places had again. The fall of Rome. What a lot of people forget is that a lot of these advanced services were available only for important public buildings. Think of the noisy bathhouse where the armpit plucker is trying to pluck your pits or government buildings. Regular residential areas where most people lived, not on the plumbing grid. That's why the Stercorarius had to go from house to house ah. and collect people's shit from their cesspools, bucket by bucket and wagon by wagon. He then had to drag all everybody's shit outside the city where he would sell it to farmers. For his troubles, the Stercorarius got 11 copper coins. Considering Rome's bumpy stone streets, it wasn't a rare occurrence for one of these shit wagons to literally flood the Stercorarius. So considering you were basically a personified toilet flush, this job was one of the weirder ones. Yeah, but I mean, we, we still kind of have jobs like that, right? Really necessary, really important to public health jobs that are pretty dirty. The urine tax collector was basically the big brother of the shit collector. As introduced by Emperor Nero, the urine tax was subsequently taken upon by his son Titus. Urine was widely used in various chemical processes, such as extracting ammonia to clean and whiten clothes, soaking animal skin before tanning, and even using it as toothpaste. And listen, during the Civil War, Southern women were collecting urine uh, because of the products that it contained that could be used in the war effort. The urine would be summoned from public toilets and cesspools. When the finances of the Roman Empire had been crippled after nearly two years of civil war, Vespasian inherited the empire and left his successor with a profit through the urine tax collection from the urine gathered at public restrooms. When Titus Vespasian's son blamed his father for applying the tax on urine, he held a piece of gold coin procured from the tax against his nose and replied, Money does not stink. The position of the whipping boy was exactly as cruel as it sounds. The education of the royal children faced some difficulty in the 15th century as education was enforced through punishments. The divine right of kings that stated God and the king's son appointed the kings was to be punished by no one, but the king brought the tutors into a dilemma. Hence, as a solution, the appointment of whipping boys was established. Another boy studying with the king's son appointed by his son would be punished if he misbehaved or did not do his homework. Stay still! In return, the whipping boy was granted noble titles and estates for his service once yeah. he was an adult. The idea behind this was the hope of developing a bond between the two, leading to the royal infant behaving and studying well to end the whipping boy's misery. So while this job could provide you with titles and other rewards, it must be a horrible feeling you to get to a bloody it. punishment for the mistakes a stuck-up child of the royal family made. From orgy planners to the cursed tablet scribe, it is safe to say that the ancient Roman Empire had a room full of extremely strange professions. And while many of these professions seem very funny, there are also some very dark ones especially considering the harsh punishments the whipping boys and vestal virgins had to face. In the end, the Roman Empire never ceases to amaze us with its extravagant lifestyle. But that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. That was pretty interesting, and I learned some things I didn't know. Are there other ones that, whether in the Roman world or in other 
civilizations that you think are really strange jobs that people don't really know about today? Use the comment section below and let me know. I'm really curious to learn more. Thanks for watching. And I want to give a big shout out to Sydney in Kyle, Texas, and Bailey in Bozeman, Montana, where I hope to visit very soon. Thank you guys for your support on Patreon.